Good morning again. It's so good to be with y'all. I left my coffee in my office or the other seat. My name is Pastor Josh. It's so good to be with y'all today. I take that little southern accent with me from Georgia. Uh, we're excited to be here with you guys this morning. Um, we have an awesome team of middle school students, high school students, and adult leaders that went and served the summer uh, in McKaysville, Georgia, and also Detroit, Michigan. And so we're going to watch a couple videos. This is going to be a time of storytelling. We, we hope that you're looking forward to, to hearing how God worked in our hearts and also in the communities that we served and the people. Just to give you a, a little FYI, student min ministries, we've been doing mission trips for a long, long time since Pastor Dave was here uh, as the youth pastor. And so um, we've been working for the last probably eight years with an organization called Team Effort. And so I think Michaela is wearing, yep, uh, 20 years of mission shirt. Um, and so that organization uh, we've been working very closely with. We've actually had some staff members that have come and worked for them, Pastor Dave's daughter, Lindsay. Uh, we have one that's been there serving all summer in missions for the last two summers, and she'll be here at the 11 o'clock service. Her name's Paula. Um, so, but we obviously felt called again to serve on our middle school team to down south again. Maybe it's a little combination about the food and the hospitality. I don't know what it is, but it's a, it's a great time. Um, and so we feel continued, uh, continuously called to go back and serve in that area. And then for our high school team, we decided to change things up. We uh, have not served in an urban uh, inner city mission experience uh, ever before. And uh, I mean, we've served, we made burritos and we've been down at the food pantry, but Detroit, Michigan is quite different, wouldn't you say? Uh, and so we felt called to, it's, it's near and dear to my heart as I live about two hours west of Detroit. Uh, and I grew up playing um, uh, peewee hockey there. And so it's a very cool area for me. Um, one of the things I want to tell you guys a little bit about is uh, the families that we served in Tennessee and Detroit. You're going to hear from them. But before, before we do that, I actually want to turn your attention to our first video. We're going to have two of these uh, this morning. The first video is going to kind of give you an idea of what we did. So check this out. Well, first of all, it, it's really humid in Tennessee. Oh. And so instantly when you walk down there, you were sweating. Um, but we had, a, we had a hammer in posts because the floor is actually sagging from the upstairs. And so we had to get like cut posts and hammer them in. The people we were helping, the one house, we were sanding in it. And his name was Mr. Johnny. And the other house, we were redoing her kitchen and drywalls for her house, and her name was Miss Teresa. Um, her neighbor, which was on the same property that we worked with, was Mr. Johnny. And that house actually was, the foundation was off and sinking by about three feet. And so um, we have just an incredible group of adult leaders that know what they're doing. And so we had a team of students and them who actually raised up with an hydraulic or airlift uh, air jack, like a six, uh, 60 ton or something like that, um, and they were able to raise the foundation of this house with these support beams. These two people live side by side, and so we would sometimes just switch off, rotate, and get to work on both homes sometimes. And we were, I was usually working on painting and sanding inside and painting outside. But just the ability to hang out with everybody and be able to just to know all those elders there to teach us and help us with all our work. I think everyone did a really good job. Our fun day, we got to do paintballing. That was a lot of fun. We got to, then after that, we got to do white rod rafting, which was just awesome since I've never done that before, but it was really fun. I remember our boat, it was all guys. And so we were really rowdy, and we were having a lot of fun on that. And we got soaked. And I completely hate water, and so I didn't expect to have fun at all. But I really enjoyed it. I had uh, certain expectations going into the mission trip because I had heard from previous mission trips that uh, the youth group would go in and we'd have a project and we'd build something and we'd be like the mission trip rock stars and you know we'd have this project we'd get done in a week. When we went to Detroit, none of that happened because we were in a different place uh, every day. Usually we were in two different places each day. We would go somewhere in the morning and then we would go some, somewhere in the afternoon. 
Well, uh, I did a lot of weeding. Really? Weed? Uh, first day was pretty much all weeding for me. I, I don't like weeding. Then we went to a farm and I weeded there also. <laughs> so a lot of weeding. I can't tell you how much I dis despise weeding. But it, well, actually it needs it. There's weeds growing everywhere and the lots, the lots there are just horrendous because uh, they, they let the grass grow. It's like up to my face, some, some of the grass there is almost as tall as me. We went around the city and did different things each day between helping out mission organizations or cleaning up trash or planting in a garden. And some of the parts that stuck out to me were when people came by and thanked us or actually helped us out just because they saw us doing it. They, at their food pantry and clothing pantry, um, I helped out with the clothing. I, so what we did is that we sorted through the clothing, put it on shelves, um, talked to the different people coming in and helped them find what they were looking for. Then we were also helping out at a urban garden, which is uh, an abandoned lot that an organization called Buckets of Rain had purchased and they grow vegetables for soup kitchens and uh, food shelters in the Detroit area. And so we got to go to one of those places and um, help them harvest collard greens, um, which was really neat to watch the students um, harvesting um, something by hand um, and knowing how difficult that is. And they could produce hundreds of pounds of food in a matter of weeks um, in this basically empty parking lot, um, which was amazing to see. So um, the one night we got all dressed up, we went out to a Greek restaurant, and um, our group thought it was going to be funny to keep ordering fried cheese, which they bring it out, and they literally light it on fire, and everyone yells, Opa! Opa! <laughs> Opa! Oh, Opa! Um, so that was kind of fun, just seeing everyone bond together over fried cheese, basically. Opa! Everyone, um, that was one of our um, one of our dinners away downtown in Greektown. But uh, I want to start out by asking uh, a few of the folks that went to the Tennessee mission trip, kind of some highlights for you and your experiences. We'll start off with John. Does this one? Hey, hi. Uh, my name's John Nixon. I, uh, I, I had the opportunity to go with the middle school to Tennessee. And I also had the unique experience of observing a lot of what was going on. The kids were doing a lot of the hard work. Um, but w one of the things that I noticed and was most notable to me was how the kids prepared themselves, how they prepared their hearts on the way down. And I almost looked at it at observing them as uh, kind of soldiers for God when they arrived at the, at, the, at the work locations because they had no idea what to expect. It was 100 degrees, but never ever did you hear anybody complaining. They knew what they were there to do. They were there to help and, and do God's work. And the, the two homes that were there, um, they weren't in good shape at all. I mean, they were in really poor condition and they just jumped right in. They just, where's the hammers, where the gloves, where the nails, where's the paint, and just started going. And it was, um, it was really cool to see their, they were just waiting for somebody to, to come out and, and talk to them. Unfortunately, uh, the one homeowner, he wasn't, uh, he, he didn't come by, but Miss Teresa was there. And um, she, I, over the, the course of the time that we were there, you could see a, a change in heart. She was a widow recently widowed, and you could see that she had a very heavy heart. And, um, but the kids would sit down and talk with her and just, just be there for her. And these are young kids, and it was really neat to see sides of them that I had never seen before. And there was, I mean, the, the, the folks, are, the lady across the street, which you'll hear about, um, just her change of heart throughout the week. And um, it was just really, really neat to see the, the teamwork, the them coming together and just wanting to help. That's what they were there for. They were there to do God's work. 
And that's what they did. You could see it on, in, their, in their eyes, in their hearts, and they, they were just so humble the whole week. You know, they're, they're rowdy middle schoolers, um, and they, they still were that, but for them, they were just humble. It was really, really neat to see a different side of these kids from Sundays and Wednesdays and spend all this time with them and see who they really were and what they were really there to do. Um, yeah, you can't really remove the middle school out of them. Yeah. That's, that's, that's just yeah, going that, to that permanent. Go they're going to be there, but we got to be kids with them too. You and know? I, yeah, I was fortunate. My son, Gavin, who's not here today, he, he got to come along too. So I got to observe him from a kind of an outsider perspective um, and just the way they all work together and just had fun doing it and did it, did it for, you know, did it for God and just wanted to help people. And it's really, it was really neat for me to see my son grow into that type of role and I look forward to continuing to see not only him but the rest of the middle schoolers grow into these roles and I also got to to see some discipleship with Joe she would um she would observe and the kids would kind of crowd around her and she would she would you know tell them some of the gospel but even you know just just watching that it was it was really an amazing experience and if there's any adults that have never gone on a mission trip you know if you want if you don't want to go to Sierra Leone um I would, I would suggest you try something like this. It's really, really uh, rewarding, and it's just kind of a, a life-changing experience. Mm -hmm. So the, the homeowners in Tennessee that we're working on, we're going to jump to Detroit in just a minute, but the, Ms. Teresa, she had um, a recent widow, and um, her husband died in a, um, a work accident um, last February, and then Mr. Johnny, who actually had cerebral palsy, he's an individual who was a newlywed, um, we raised the foundation of his home that you saw in the video um, with a team of uh, five or six people. Um, we weren't able to actually meet Mr. Johnny and his wife. Um, they were somehow interrelated. They were connected somehow uh, with Miss Teresa, but we were able to spend a lot of time with his, their neighbor across the street. And um, uh, Miss Shirley, and I'm going to have Taylor actually just talk about those experiences with her and the blessing that was uh, to meet her uh, while we were working and spend time with them. And, Talk about a little bit of the change that happened with her life, too, that you saw. Does this work? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Taylor, and the neighbor across the street is named Miss Shirley, and she was a widow, too. And her, uh, well, she was uh, poisoned with silver, and I guess the vitamins she was taking poisoned her, and oh, I'm brain dead right now. Yeah, pretty much. And um, when we didn't have anywhere to go, she would just have, one time she actually left and left her door open and let us just go in there and go use the restroom and stuff like that. And oh, <laughs> I'm brain dead. Um, <laughs> uh, she got to know us, right? And then what happened? She actually joined us for some of the worship and when we prayed, she actually joined in and asked us to pray for her and all of us and her mother. It was a good experience with her. Yeah, she was probably one of the most brightest spots for us that we got to meet. Um, her spirit and her heart, um, she was, she was um, misdiagnosed with some medication that she had, and so she actually had silver poisoning. Um, and so she kind of looked like a metallic, um, shiny bluish color to and we didn't know exactly what was wrong with her but she ended up sharing with that uh, eventually um, in the middle of the week and started opening her heart and opening her word with us the word of God with us uh, in worship and then she asked us to pray for her mother too by the end of the week and so that was really cool um, so this this trip Tennessee was more of like the the, the you know house building uh, a lot of that work repairs that we were doing we're going to shift to Detroit, and that was completely different, um, you know. And so I'm going to ask Megan to kind of give a little bit of some of her experiences with that. It was so different than doing home repairs as we were in the city. Um, Megan, will you share that? So like Josh said, we couldn't do home repairs because of all the codes of the city. So each day we had a different work site, and it was smaller stuff, but it was meaningful stuff. So one day we went, and we were cleaning up different lots and we f the weeds were like shoulder height so um, because after we cleaned it up they were going to mow it down and start an urban garden but we started at the park and 
We were probably there for like a good hour and a half to two hours, just cleaning up trash. And then one guy came over and he said, his name was Marshall, and he said, I've been praying for you guys to come because every day I'm here by myself cleaning up this park and nobody even notices. But then we came and we helped him out. So, And he actually followed us to all our different lots. So he was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, any of you guys want to share about, um, you know, where were you at, Dan? Uh, because we were working with the Detroit Rescue Mission. To give you an idea of that, um, it's the largest rescue mission in the United States. It's almost 40 different sites um, that are in this. Harrisburg doesn't even come close. Um, and so we were kind of, our teams of two, we were splitting teams of two because we had almost 50 of us. Um, we were at different places. We could have been 30 miles apart from each other through the day. So, Dan, would you tell us a, a little bit about a different experience? So the one day we... we there was this organization called Buckets of Rain, and they uh, bought empty lots and made urban gardens. So the one day, like it said in the video, we went and helped out there to harvest some of the food to give to the food pantries and donate around the city. What happened? Did you, did you get a, were you some of the individuals, did you get to meet the individual that came at the end who asked for the food? Who, were in, who was there? You were there? The guy that the, the guy that was liter- asking for food literally that day at that moment. Uh, oh yeah, the one guy walked up and asked for food because he needed some food, and so they gave it to him. They were, I mean, he was completely blown away that like right then and there he'd be able to have food ready for him, packaged uh, to give to him. Um, I, do any of you know exactly how much produce they did every every week or every couple of weeks? Do you know? It was a lot. Um, so some of, the, some of the lots that you saw, um, you would think, well, just mow them and clean them up. But they actually had the, I think Joe found this out, they had the financial resources to cut the, lo- the lots one time a year. And if they weren't done, nothing was going to get, if they weren't cleaned and, and taken care of, they weren't going to get heavy machinery and expensive machinery in there to do at all. So, um, yeah, um, we're going to transition into our, our second part of this video, and in this video, this, this portion is more on our theme. We, we were singing a song, I, I mentioned to John right in the middle of worship, uh, from the song Beautiful Things. You make beautiful things out of us, you make beautiful things out of dust. What could be uprooted and be beautiful with fruit from this ground and this garden? And we got to see that in Detroit, and we also got to see that in the small ways that we were changing and restoring uh, people's lives in Tennessee. So this video, take a look at this, and then we're going to continue our morning. Our entire focus for both of our trips is, is, uh, was about our brokenness. Not only just identifying some of those areas, but also seeing how God wants to break through in them. The chapel, it was a lot of fun. People there were extremely nice, and they had good lessons for the week. And people, they'd always have people speaking, workday stories, and they always had really good stories that show God and all. Really tired out after each work day, but I did really enjoy the evening worship. We, I, I liked the message. I liked the theme of brokenness and healing. And I just enjoyed the services a lot as a whole. The whole theme for the week was brokenness. And one of the main things I remember from the chapel is the verse of Mary and how she broke the alabaster jar all over Jesus before his burial. I remember one of the main things, I think this is always gonna stick with me, but it talked about how God has all the glue, but if you don't give him all the pieces to your broken alabaster jar, he can't put it back together. Uh, we, were, we were saying how like we're not broken on the same level that they are. Um, you know, we don't have the problem of finding food to eat or finding shelter or clothes or dealing with uh, the bank repossessing our house or anything like that, but we're, we're broken in different ways and we were each uh, dealing with our brokenness as we were helping these people with their brokenness. And the one night, um, we were talking about brokenness and how it was in your life and how things that you've been through and just about everyone in my small group broke down and it was kind of my way of seeing God was actually present with us that week. He was in our lives, he was moving us and um, just people who I hadn't really known before the trip, just pouring their life out, pouring out how 
they were broken at one point and now you know they've seen God they're on this trip because God wants them to be there um, just things like that where I thought it was just I really saw God moving even before the trip moving people to come on this trip because he knew they needed to be here the city was broken and in need of healing and I think it kind of tied in with the message well because when you look at the people in the city they're broken I mean they're fa they face a lot of challenges and the city needs some help but at the same time you can still see the people appreciate what people do for their city they love their city and they're almost proud of it I think they're proud of it and I think that's the attitude that everyone should take when it comes to dealing with brokenness to just not give up that question was asked Wednesday night on the mission trip of where did I see God in the brokenness and I didn't really have an answer that, that night, um, but I prayed about it and on Thursday uh, we were working with buckets of rain, I believe, and uh, when we were just finishing up that day, uh, a man came to uh, grab some food and he was so overjoyed to see that um, some of the ripe food was already picked up so that he would be able to, to uh, bring it back to his family. So. That's where I saw God. I think we tend to take ourselves and our circumstances for granted too much. And we think things are so bad, but we go to help someone else and we realize that we truly are blessed. So I believe that everyone should have the opportunity to do a missions trip. And like I say, it doesn't matter if it's locally, long distance, whatever. Everyone should be encouraged to do it. Why would you travel all the way from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to come to Detroit to help us? And I said, well, why wouldn't we? Um, I said, your city is hurting and there's a need. And so we felt called to come and respond to that need. And as Christians, that's what our call is to do. So I've asked a couple of students to kind of share some iconic moments for them as they saw God at work. Um, Evie, we were, at the, we were at the Capuchin Soup Kitchen, and we got a chance to um, see their um, organization, and it started out as a Franciscan uh, a food kitchen um, with a bunch of monks, a brotherhood, and um, we ended up being able to sort food and distribute clothing and um, beans and whatnot, but then we got to spend some time with the folks that were the patrons of the food uh, kitchen. Um, Capuchin Soup Kitchen, I think it was the first one established in, in inner city Detroit. Tell us a little bit about that cool encounter that you had with um, Miss Jean. Um, so uh, first we went to this place and it was called Capuchin and um, we, they distributed food from there and clothing so people could just come from the community, grab some clothes for their family. They had like a bunch of different things. It was kind of almost like a Salvation Army, but they like, they could come and they do kind of like a background check on them and then they could come in and pick up as much as they needed. And I was out um, putting clothes back on the racks, helping um, customers find clothes that they needed, like whatever they were looking for. I would kind of talk to them, just see how they were doing. And um, I was just going through, talking to people, and I met this lady named Jean, and I mean, she just like, she had like a spark and she was like, hi. And I was like, hi, and she said, like, how are you? I said, I'm doing really good, how are you? And she said, good. So I kind of like, we finished our conversation, we went on, and I came back to her, and all of a sudden she goes, well, um, you're a Christian, and you're here on a church group. And I, I just kind of looked at her, I was like, excuse you? Because I was like, you barely know me. Like, how did you, how did you pick up on that? And it was because of the way I carried myself, because of this church, because of my youth group. She knew right like that, that I was there um, for that reason, and it was truly just amazing to me that God shines through me that much. Um, I really didn't realize it until she pretty much brought it up to me, and I was completely astonished by it, and then before she left, I went over to her and I said, I probably won't see you again, so I wanted to say goodbye, and she, she stopped me. She said, no, we don't say goodbye. I, we say, see you later. So I said, okay, see you later. 
and then, so we finish up our task there, and we go, and we actually ate lunch with the people at the soup kitchen, and guess who I saw? I saw Jean again, and I ran over to her, and I said, I said, you were right. I, it wasn't a goodbye, it was a see you later, and um, she was just truly amazing to me. She showed me um, so much about myself. She taught me so much about God, um, just through people. Uh, I, I never really could pick up God through people, and uh, she really showed me him and showed me that he actually does shine through me, too. So it's really touching. Amen. <laughs> Michaela, would you tell us a little bit about what you learned from, from God this week, that week in Detroit? Well, going into this week, I had been struggling with a couple different issues personally about my faith and where my faith, where I was in my walk with God. Um, so I went into this week kind of with mild expectations as to whether or not I would be able to completely reconnect with God and kind of get back on track with my walk with him. Um, also, at I was serving at uh, the Capuchin Soup Kitchen, and I was helping to load crates of food and clothing and other various items into the back of people's car. And I was working with this one lady, and I never learned her name. And I, looking back now, I wish I would have. But we were helping, it was myself and Matt Nicholas, another student, we were helping to load crates of food and bags of clothing into her car. And she had probably about seven big trash bags full of clothes. And she puts them in the back of her car and she just started to just break down with tears everywhere. And so we sat with her and she told us her story about how uh, she used to be very wealthy, but when the city went bankrupt, she went bankrupt as well. She lost her house, and it was her and her three kids just living out of their car, and just how she was now the main provider for not only her kids and her immediate family, but all of her neighbors who were not able to leave their homes depended on her to get food, to get clothes, and to just help them to be able to survive. And she had just been feeling so stressed, like she was going through this struggle alone. And that really st stuck out to me, is that I think so many times, so many of us feel like when we're struggling, we're struggling through everything alone. And we often forget that we have an amazing support system in our church family and in Christ that's there to back us up and to say, you're not going through this alone. And there's many other people who are struggling through the same issues as yourself. So we sat there and we prayed with her and she just thanked us for helping her to realize that, you know, no matter where you look, there's good and there's people who are willing to support you and lift you up. So that's, that's where I saw God this week. Amen. Sarah, will you tell us a little bit about um, Ms. Brown and um, when we went into her neighborhood, we worked with um, caring communities, right? Bridging communities. Um, and the street, when Josh Crump and I were filming, actually we saw there were like 30 some homes that were blocked up and that were abandoned and that were looted. Um, but there was one home right in the middle, Miss Brown's house that we got to serve at. Can you tell us a little bit about her? Yeah, Miss Brown's house, it was pretty much the only like not boarded up house on her street. And like Josh said, we went, she's a client of Bridging Communities, and we went and we did, like, she was older, so she wasn't capable of doing anything around the house, really, so she needed some branches trimmed and the grass mowed and some weeding done, and we did that for her, and she was a little bit particular, mostly because these kids were coming in, and they don't know what they're doing, so I got to talk to her and make tell her everything's okay. Yeah, she was watching everything. And um, I got to talk to her, and she said that her husband had died, and her grandson actually went to college somewhere where Josh lived, and that was cool. And everything that we did, she was like, oh, no, you don't have to do that. I don't want to beg. And it just, 
she said that she thanked us for everything that we did, and she just said how she could see God work thru working through us and how we had such good hearts and we were such good kids and stuff, and it was really nice. She had a hard time. I think one of the first things she said when I, I got to meet with her first um, inside her house before the kids came in, she said, I don't like charity. I don't like accepting help when I, when I need help. And I think we could all, you know, uh, appeal to that in some fashion of, of, you know, relying upon our own strength and not accepting <laughs> the love of God. And, and, I mean, we were literally trying to restore small bits of, and pieces of the communities that we were and um, helping encourage hearts um, and spirits. And so, um, but I told her that I agree with her and I don't like to do that either. It's so tough. Um, but in the same way, when we truly allow to surrender uh, and allow God to work, he heals us, he restores us bit by bit, and it's not, our, not, not ourselves. Um, and so we got to all experience that in a little bit uh, in small ways. Um, we hope that you guys would be able to, to, to serve as well. I want to close, actually, our time of this. We, we're going to have, our students are going to be serving communion. Um, we have still a beautiful part of service left over, but I want to close with Joe sharing um, some of her, uh, her thoughts. She's got a whole entire encyclopedia list, so be prepared for that, but no, hopefully it'll, you know, yes. No, <laughs> but I want to close with that, and then if you have, again, if you have any questions, please, please see the students afterwards, you know, after service, sometime throughout when we kick off next week, talk to them about their experiences. Um, yeah. First of all, this was the best year for missions. Um, our, our youth groups, be them middle school or high school, you can be so proud of who they were. And during the amazing youth race, Mr. Zeber always says, remember who you are. Represent us well. And they did above and beyond that. During the evenings, you know, like parents, I just want you to know that when your kids fight to come to worship because they, you know, I don't want to get out of bed. That's an act for you. These kids stood in line 15 minutes before worship started so they could be in there first. Um, they wanted to be in the front so they could dance in the aisles. That's the kind of kids you're raising up. Uh, they were not afraid of who was there um, we were only upstaged by one little sixth grader who, in Tennessee who was given the microphone and much like me then chose to preach a message. Little pastor. He was awesome. Little pastor. But um, he, our kids, were, they would volunteer. There was no, the adults complained that there was no air conditioning. Every, all day, every day. The kids just, okay, so it's going to be hot. Let's just move on. They were fantastic. Um, and the honesty they shared in small group. Some of these kids, we, I heard more in this week. Two of the young men, I didn't even know had voices, you know, until this week. And two other ones I knew had voices, but I didn't know were so deep in their spiritual walk. It was amazing to be with the middle school. And you know, I don't say that if it isn't true, because I'm not middle school minded. <laughs> right, Taylor? <laughs> Taylor had a, an amazing story. She had, she had, can I share it? Okay. Okay. She had some medicine she had to take and she thought she lost it and she was very worked up and everybody was yelling at everyone else because they weren't taking care of her medicine and this other member of the youth group who usually is not attuned to anything going on around her sat down <laughs> and took out everything out of the case, out of the book bag, one by one, until she found Taylor's medicine. And what she said was, I know how I would feel if I didn't have my medicine 
and it wasn't around, and I'd have to wait two hours till we get back. That kind of insight from, from this young lady was beyond me. I, it was just, it warmed my heart. Detroit, something happened in Detroit that Josh has been working, that has never happened with our youth group. It's, he's been working towards it, but it first came to fruition in Detroit. And that is inclusive versus exclusive. Teenage years are tough. And having that one kid that just doesn't fit the mold and doesn't want to be part of the group but wants to be part of the group. But we've been working, and Josh especially has made that the, the chemistry of what we're about, is that no matter who comes through our doors, there's a place for you. And... There were no, to the point that our kids noticed there were two kids in the other youth group that was with us in Detroit that weren't being included in their group, and they invited them to play, what was it, catchphrase. And so those kids would wait for our team to come back so they could play with our group. And that sounds... Um, elementary almost, but it was almost like seeing heaven for what we can see, where everyone's accepted, everyone is just loved, and that's where I saw God working. And then we went to the Tigers game. Is that who we went to see? And okay, baseball's not my thing. I'm a football person. Detroit Tigers. And so... I sat down by the concession stand because I figured I'd have more fun there. <laughs> and I met this woman who was older than me. I was so thrilled. And she sat down and we talked for two and a half innings. And then her daughter finally came down to find out where mom had gone because this was her birthday present, the baseball ticket. <laughs> she thought it was funny, too. Um, so she took me. She said, we exchanged information. She goes, I'm going to be in Harrisburg at the end of August. Can I call you? I said, sure. And thinking, for real, this woman's not going to. The last week of August, she and I met at the Hilton. We had um, lunch. She introduced me to her sister, and she brought me a book. And she goes, now, there's some racy parts in the book, but she goes, just Read it for who God's talking about his people in this book. And when, when I left, she said, now we're family. She goes, because in God's house, we just live in different parts of the world, but we're all family. Amen. Would you guys all say that your life was changed because of that, because of serving and giving? I mean, it's a week of vacation would you encourage all of them to join us and serve yourself? Uh, if you feel like that you don't have a role or you can't build homes, I can't build homes like 90% of the guys around us, but uh, you, 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 there's a role for every single one of us with our gifts, and so we'd love for you to serve. Uh, this is a missional church, so continue to see that and see your role as that. Um, and uh, again, thank them. Uh, give, would you give them a round of applause as well? All of them. Um, And as, and as I close, please be in prayer for us as we discern uh, where we're supposed to go next summer. With that, let me pray for us, and then we're going to transition into time of communion. God, we thank you so much for who you are, for these stories, more importantly, for the people behind the stories. God, whom you love so much, who you have given your life for, your son, uh, that he would give his life as a ransom for every single one of us, God. Um, we are the chief among sinners, and you love us, and you want to use us. You qualify us for ministry, for your kingdom work. And I pray that each one of us would take that fire and that challenge to be encouraged, God, to live a life on mission, God, to step our game up for you and for each other, God, because that's what you called us to do. Thank you so much for this morning, for the chance to worship together as your body. 
Continue to bless us as we partake in this special time of communion, as we take your elements, God, and move and live with you in our lives going forward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.